The story is told of a Sunday school teacher who was explaining to a group of children what they had to do to go to heaven. But he wanted to know what they already knew, so he decided to ask them a series of questions. He said to them, if I sell my house and my car and I give all the money to the church, would that get me into heaven? And all the whole class, all the children went, no, that won't get you there. And he said, well, what if I'm kind to animals and I give sweets to children? Would that get me into heaven? And the children are like, no, that won't get you into heaven either. He said, well, then how can I get into heaven? And a child put up their hand at the back and said, you've got to be dead. <laughs> Well, that is true. That is true. If you've, if, you, if you've been a Christian for a while, you will have heard statements like, it's not good people who go to heaven, but saved people who go to heaven. It's not good people who go to heaven, but forgiven people who go to heaven. And yet, if good people did go to heaven, well, that would make sense, wouldn't it? I mean, that seems fair. Um, if you've been a good person, that, that you should be rewarded. If you've been good throughout your life, then certainly if there is an afterlife, you should be rewarded for that. I mean, you've tried to live out a good life. You've tried to be good for God, at least. So, so you can understand why one may want that to be true. The problem is, the problem is, according to the New Testament, you and I are not good enough to go to heaven. Certainly not based on our behavior. Paul would write, there is no one righteous, not even one. He's saying no one will be declared righteous good enough by keeping the law, by their deeds, or by attempting to be good and keep the rules. And then a verse that many of us have heard our whole lives, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we know there's nothing in the New Testament that says, if you will keep following the rules, then you get to go to heaven. When we follow Jesus through the Gospels, I mean, he, we see he raises the standard so high that everybody fell short. If you've read the Sermon on the Mount, um, he took good and what was required to a whole new level. He, he set a standard that the best people at keeping the law at the time. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they found themselves falling short. Jesus said, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, Jesus made, statement like, made statements like that said, You've heard it said, um, you know, you say this is the standard. I say this is the standard. He said, you, You've heard it, it that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Well, that's everybody right here. <laughs> you have heard it said, that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. A whole new level. And then the chapter ends with what Jesus says the standard is. So here's the standard. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And you and I, you and I, we are not that good. The clarifying answer to how good we have to be, if good enough is going to be the standard, is perfect. So if being good was the standard, if how we lived our lives and kept the rules was the standard, then you and I would not make the cut. But people who believe that good people go to heaven always also believe that they'll make the cut. That they are a good person. Or compared to those who they may know and compare themselves with, they may even be a good person. But according to Jesus' standard of what is good and good enough, 
Not so much. And that is why we need a savior. That is why it's not about rules. It's not a, a list. It's not about having an excuse. It's why the world needed a savior. And that's why it is good news that Jesus was the only one who was good enough to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. But my hunch is you knew all of this already before I said any of it. But the more complicated question is, what then is the role of rule keeping in the scriptures? And today I want to look at that in the context of Jewish tradition and then the Christian faith. Because if rule keeping won't get you into heaven, then why all the rules? And wherever did we get the idea, that, that where did the, the idea come from that if you are good enough, you get into heaven? So to start with, let's begin with Jewish tradition. Or specifically because it's often quoted, the Ten Commandments. Now many people think that keeping the Ten Commandments is what is important. But of course if you ask them to name them, they wouldn't be able to name normally more than about three. Shall not murder, everyone knows that one. Shall not commit adultery, everyone knows that one. Shall not steal. Um. <laughs> and that's about it. But what was the role of the Ten Commandments? Well, our first clue is where they are actually found, and it's in the book of Exodus. Now, the book of Exodus chronicles Israel's exodus out of Egyptian slavery. Remember, God had sent Moses to Pharaoh and said to say to, to Pharaoh, let my people go. And in a dramatic exodus, they eventually leave. But for over 400 years, they had been slaves in Egypt. They do not have any of their own civil laws. They have no constitution. They have not functioned independently of Egypt's laws. And there is about one million of them. Some scholars say perhaps even as close to two million exited Egypt with Moses. So then God through Moses provides for the nation a constitution, some laws, civil laws, so that they can function as a society where, where there are rules that they have to follow. And if they don't follow those rules so that society can function, there will be punishment if they broke them. Because up until now, they had been under the boot of Egypt. And they had just been told what to do as slaves. And for the first time, they are free in 400 years. But now, where, what they have to do is manage that freedom. Now they have all this freedom, no Egyptian telling them how to live. So God in his mercy gives them this law. Now the law God gave Moses to give to the people, it doesn't show up until chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. So what is the first 19 chapters about? Well, the first 19 chapters is God is demonstrating his love and his concern for a group of people he considered his own. His people that he delivered, and not because they kept the law, they didn't yet have a law when he delivered them. And not because they were obeying the rules, they didn't even know what the rules were when he delivered them. This is all pre-law. So what you always need to understand, when you, when you come to the scriptures, when it comes to God and the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament and the God that we worship, relationship always has to precede the rules. Relationship always precedes the rules. Comes ahead of the rules. So, just, just an aside on this, not... not just stop there on the note thing. Um, just an aside, that means when you and I expect those who are not in relationship with Jesus to keep our rules, we get it the wrong way around. As good as the rules may be, we've actually got it the wrong way around. We're putting a burden on them they wouldn't be able to keep. So God did not give Israel the law as a means of establishing a relationship with him. God gave Israel the law because they were already in a relationship with him. It wasn't a condition, it was a confirmation. That they were in the family. They were his. So about three months after they leave Egypt, Moses leads them to the foot of Mount Sinai. God provides this extraordinary, if you read it, extraordinary constitution and law in order to guide the people. In fact, the law God gave the ancient Israelites in many ways was so far ahead of its time, there is really no explanation for it. Other than it came from God and has a divine element 
to it. Some of the things God gives in his law wouldn't show up in other civilizations for another 1,500 years. There are so many rights and protections built into the law for, that God gives his people, who in that period, people who in that period would have had no rights and had no protections. For example, slavery. If they did have slaves from conquered nations in the context of the Mosaic law, it is nothing like the slavery that was happening in other parts of the world at the time. Slaves under the Mosaic law, law still had some rights. It was more like um, indentured servitude. The whole idea of unrestricted domination of one human being over another was not permitted under the law of Moses. What they had experienced as slaves in Egypt was not permitted among them. Even slaves were to have certain rights, which was unprecedented. You could sell yourself into slavery, but you could also buy yourself out. Now, the Old Testament law comes under a lot of criticism in many parts. But remember, it's written for a particular time to a particular group of people. Now, listen how it begins. It doesn't begin with you shall and you shall not. Here is the preamble to this ancient constitution. Here is how it starts. I am the Lord, your God. In other words, we are already in relationship. And this is what I've already done for you, is what he says. Who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Just a few months ago, you belonged to Pharaoh, but now you belong to me. A few months ago, you belonged to Pharaoh and you had no freedom, no land, no hope, no future. Now you belong to me. And you belong to me without me requiring anything from you, except there was one single expression of trust. All I ask was that you put the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of your home as a symbol that you trusted in Yahweh. I asked for one single expression of trust that you, and you were in. And now that you know that I have your best interest in mind, I want you to follow me and I want you to obey me. And then God, puts, then God gets to the, the first real command. You, now that you know who I am, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, the ten plagues that came over Egypt was God showing his power over the gods of Egypt. In ancient times, what they believed was every area, every piece of land had its own god. So whatever land you were in, you would adopt that god. So the idea is that Yahweh came and showed his power in Egypt, it's like he was coming onto their home field advantage and then dominated God after God after God, humiliating the entire pantheon of Egyptian gods. Now, God would take each one of the Egyptian gods and, and really make a mockery of them. You like the river, Nile River, you worship the Nile River, you think it's the source of life, I'll turn it into blood. Happy was the Egyptian god of the Nile. The Egyptians also saw birds and crocodiles and snakes and turtles and frogs as living images of a particular god or goddess. So God basically said, you worship frogs? I think yeah, there is, you know, this is, the, the frog god was Haket. So God said, um, you want to worship it? I'll make it a plague for you. You worship the sun? That's the ninth um, plague. God brings darkness for three days. Coming against their main god was the god Amun-Ra, god of the sun. Now, that doesn't sound so bad when you first read it in the context of Exodus. I mean, three days of darkness, mm. compared to the other plagues, when you've read them, that seems like an easy one. Compared, of course, unless, of course, you're worshipping the sun, then three days of darkness is a scary thing, when this is your god. So God is saying to his people, this is what I want you to know. I am your saviour. I am your rescuer. And all I need you to do is to trust me. That's it. You shall have no other gods before me. Trust me. And then the next command was also unprecedented. It would take another 1,500 years before the next civilization caught up with this statement. I am the Lord your God. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. No image. There is nothing that represents me accurately. You will have no idol 
a system of worship with an idol was unheard of at the time. In fact, if you know the story, it wasn't long before they broke this rule themselves. They couldn't imagine worship without an object of their worship. And Yahweh, Yahweh was saying to them, I am the object of your worship, and there is nothing that can explain me. There is nothing that can contain me. And then the command we all know about and easily break. No one mentions this as keeping the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. In other words, I want you to take a day off. What? They would have said, we will starve. No, says God. I will take care of you. Why? What's the point? I want you to trust me. Show me that you trust me. There was to be a day when no one worked. And get this, not even their slaves could work on the Sabbath. God was saying to them, I want to show you that I can sustain you. Some of us need to hear that. Some of us, probably all of us. Then the next six laws are basically, here is how you treat people and honor people. And then God, through this ancient, ancient law, God reveals a value system that he basically says, honor me because I rescued you, and honor others. They are made in my image. So these ten are like a summary of the commands that he gives them. There were actually 613 laws given, because this was their civil law. This had to touch every single aspect of their lives. But the point being, relationship precedes the rules. The Israelites did not behave their way in. And when we read the rest of the story, we see they were not able to misbehave their way out. At no point did they stop being his people because of their behavior. Through all their rebellion, God never abandoned his people. When they gave up on God's law, they were giving up on their freedom, not their belonging. The law was simply confirmation of God's love for them. And then 1,500 years later, Jesus gathers with the 12 apostles and establishes a new covenant. Not just for a single nation, Israel, but now for the whole world. Just as God had delivered Israel from Egypt, Jesus came now to deliver the world from slavery too. The ultimate, of course, the consequence of sin. And the terms and the conditions would be exactly the same as it was 1,500 years earlier. A single expression of trust. Paul again. Um, was on both sides of the aisle. He was first a Pharisee and followed all the laws. And then he became a Jesus follower. Paul, he understood this parallel track. He understood this parallel of what God had done for the nation of Israel 1,500 years before and what God had done through Jesus for the entire world. So he writes and says, look, just as God demonstrated his love for, for the nation of Israel... This is what he writes. God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now this is important for Paul, that his readers understand that while he, Paul, was an enemy of Jesus' followers, persecuting Jesus' followers, even when he was wrong in his belief and understanding about God, when God knew everything he was still about to do even, he says Jesus died for his sin anyway. Paul's emphasis that Christ died for us while we were still sinners, before we've done anything, before we knew there was anything that even needed to be done. Then two verses later he writes this, For if... While we were God's enemies, talking about himself, but all of us to some extent, while we were God's enemies, before we did anything, before we knew there was anything to do, we were reconciled to him. How did he do it? He tells us. Is it through rule keeping? Is it through doing our best? He says no. Through the death of his son. A single expression of trust in his son is all it takes to belong. And 
And just as we don't behave our way in as Christians, we don't misbehave our way out. Just like your children can't misbehave their way out of your family. At times you might have felt that. And can't happen. They're still family. All right. The law is simply confirmation of God's love for us. So why all the rules? For Israel, God was not attempting to make bad people good. God was keeping free people free. And the same is true for you and the same is true for me. God wants what is best for you. With God, as with all good parents, relationship always precedes the rules. And the rules are simply God's way of saying, because I love you, here is how I want you to live. Because I love you, here is how I want you to forgive. Because I love you, here is how I want you to serve one another. Because I love you, here is how I want you to treat people. Here is how I want you to treat your enemies. And I know what brings the most happiness and fulfillment. And I know what brings the most peace. And that is to follow what my son modeled. Jesus did not teach that good people go to heaven. And yet, Jesus instructed his followers to be good. And more than that, to do good. To be good and to do good to each other. Which means Jesus believed that we were capable of doing good. And Jesus believed that we're capable and able to recognize the difference between good and bad, good and evil, and what's good for another person, and what's not good for another person. So he instructed his followers to do good and to be good. He, he said to his followers, in the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We know that we are reconciled to God by grace. We know that. And we chose to follow and we choose then to obey out of gratitude for that. Jesus summarized his new covenant with one law. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what it looks like to follow and obey me. Here is your one rule, which we talk about often. Love one another, he said. This is the command. Love one another as I have loved you. That's it. Jesus' invitation to relationship is a standing invitation. An invitation accepted not through a promises or promises to do better on our part. An invitation that is simply accepted by acknowledging what he has already done. And even in the old covenant, God saved Israel by grace. They came through the Red Sea. They were fed. They were provided for they really added nothing. They don't come to Sinai and the giving of the law as a means to salvation. They already were saved when they got there. This is where they came to learn how to love God. This isn't where they came to be saved. They already had that. This is where they came to learn how to love their God. And in the same way, our relationship with God is not predicated on keeping rules. The rules and the laws are there to keep us free. And the good deeds and the good works are there to show that we love Him and give Him glory. So may your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds, your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's leave it there. Let's stand. Let's pray.